and uh, uh, we, we uh, ten minutes each. Uh, there, thereafter, we actually have give space for a bit of interaction, questions. And uh, I would like us to, when it comes to questions, I would like us to focus on on partnerships because we need, we really need to capture that. We have actually captured quite a bit on cooperatives, but I would like us to actually uh, capture issues around uh, partnerships so that we can actually uh, be able to add value to. To today's uh, subsession. Now and thereafter, we actually call upon our respondents who actually come in for five minutes each, uh, at least to respond. Um, I'm sure they have actually been taking notes, and listening, and then thereafter we should actually be able to wrap up and uh, uh, vacate the, the room for for an activity at uh, at, at five o'clock. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, invite uh, our, our our next speaker now. Yeah, uh, I have problems pronouncing her name, but I think it will be okay. Is this, is, is there is one uh, Chavez or Shilane? Sh Shilane. Shilane is okay. Shilane from, uh, uh, from uh, 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 Costa Rica, uh, 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 from a women group, uh, a coordinator uh, in a farm organization that is, that is really women. And, uh, and you're welcome. Huh? Gracias y buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Chirlene Chávez y soy de Costa Rica y represento a una organización de mujeres que se llama la Coordinadora de Mujeres Campesinas. Es una organización que tiene presencia en todo el país. Agrupamos alrededor de 700 mujeres y sus familias. Y para nosotros es un placer estar acá, les agradecemos mucho y esperamos compartir con ustedes pues, la experiencia que hemos tenido desde since the, the, as of the implementation of the esteem project. I'd like to tell you that initially, as most of the organizations, we have already covered several stages. Initially, we've already been in existence for over 10 years and originally, not originally, but in 2006, 2007, we had a difficult organization crisis. Our organization had to rethink the work it was performing, and at that time, we had to close rank doors and reorganize internally. In that process, we missed part of the political events in the country, and that was an important loss of the organization structure. Esteem, therefore, was a great opportunity as it allowed us to bring together a national process such as the organization of women known as ANAMAR, the Farmers National uh, Group, AFAR and other organizations that existed over time to establish what we know today as the platform of rural entrepreneur organizations of Costa Rica. The contribution of ESIN, as I said, strengthened the political incident action of the organization, which at that time was very weak. Clearly, this coincided with a new era in the association of social and producing organizations of Costa Rica and has allowed us to generate visibility for these organizations. The picture you see there is a recent protest uh, on July 31st last when there was an important adjustment resulted. Taxes to production assets, specifically the land, were last by 20 percent. Values in the countries have risen very high, and this went against the vocation of the land resource. So this was a march and a fight. It wasn't a march only which was visible, but it's been the fight we've had for over the past few years. And this theme has been of great help to this end. The project also allowed us to make a diagnosis of obstacles to agriculture and barriers to access. 
although it's true that was the original goal. But over time, we have been able to make a diagnosis and a collection prioritizing problems as well, which we have addressed as necessary. As a platform, the Essene project supported us in strengthening the incident work to strengthen us as women. Usually, political actions in our environment are not those of women, although we carry out important work in the production area and in other areas, but it's sort of not well seen that we women go around doing politics. But it is a real need we have. Why? Because not only do we represent 50% of the gender, but also we carry out a high number of roles at home and with our families and at work. Clearly, women changed the agenda of the platform and became visible. Oftentimes, when only men think that we're going to go out to the street to protest, we need the feminine touch. We say no. But first, we want to negotiate this with the minister. We want to have a firm political position. We want to review the agreements we're going to negotiate. And this clearly has made a difference in our actions. Espina has also supported us developing some specific studies, such as stated in the proposal, to strengthen research. In this presentation, I can't tell you the details of all the studies, but because several were carried out, not only those listed here. However, there were three studies that were of special importance for the project. One was relating to market information analysis, because although the markets are as old as the country, there was no baseline study indicating the types of markets, one that specifically identified the problems of farm prices, where intermediation is what takes the highest value from the farmers. The incidence determined by international studies for farmers, for the smallhold farmers, uh, uh, which was conducted about five, ten years ago, and we spoke of the influence of international prices was sort of a utopia, something that would never occur. But today, when we feel threatened, for example, by production and international prices of our products, we see that this is necessary. Another area in which ESPIN has helped was in the operational diagnosis, as we call it, of the FENASA law implementation. This is related to animal husbandry. This is the National Animal Health Service. But really, the implementation of this law brings about a change in the paradigm of the system. It's not that the law is unnecessary or that there, are nothing, or there is nothing to correct. But as farmers don't have the resources to make an immediate change in our production system. And the law requires these changes immediately. It got to a point where we couldn't ship our cattle to the slaughterhouse because we didn't have the permits. We didn't have the identification requirements. And as the study identified, maybe it's not that the instruments weren't, were impossible to have, but we didn't have information in that, that is the farmers didn't have the information all this to all this resulted in an interesting proposal which we are still developing and that relates to 
actions related to sovereignty, the importance of food sovereignty for the country. Costa Rica has no legislation on food sovereignty. Only recently, the first attempts have been made. We must start by including in le our legislation the importance of food security. And as you can see, this has uh, significant political implications as we are a country that basically imports all the food. We have coffee, banana, and recently technology. This is what we need to be able to export. So as a result, our political umbrella, the government in office, for them, it's not politically correct that we once again want to get involved in food sovereignty issues. We've worked and uh, with sponsorship of ASFIN to resolve this issue. We've helped to develop a broader platform that today is called the Agri-Food Group. And this has been a very important achievement for us. Another issue in which we've made progress with the FIN is the instance on farmers fairs. This farmers fairs program is a program that allows the marketing or helps small farmers to market their goods. Women broadly participate in these fairs from producing a, a commodities, selling them. We least are involved in the spending of money, but in all the rest, we participate greatly. And the structure of these fairs has been one traditionally led by men, where we women had very little participation because everything was done and everything had been set. Thanks to Efin and to a study which was carried a study that was done only in two of the 180 fairs that currently we have in the country, we were able to have an important voice in the national fairs program. And this is very important because when these fairs, as I said, there are markets that are in the street every weekend, Saturdays and Sundays, where about 8,000 families participate. It's a farmer's program managed by farmers. That's why with the effort that we're doing in food sovereignty, we've tried to have an impact on the program so that the program is the spearhead of the food security issues because there we sell all what our country produces and we sell to our co-nationals. Obviously, the fair has some threats, including logistics, and currently we also have a pilot project for garlic production, garlic for consumption, which is within as been is something that has not made great progress. There's a lot for political develop policy development, but not for the more production, the operational side. Another issue within has been, as I mentioned, participation in this uh, preparation of the tax reform project, which was the flagship project of the administration. And the farmers there had a very strong voice. We said, these are the impacts we'll suffer. We cannot allow it. Of course, other sectors joined us, and we also participated in uh, greater demonstrations and were successful. Our main achievement has been the amendment to the real estate law. As to lessons learned, clearly, the organization of women, a CMC and a MAT platform, have understood that we need to establish alliances to work and have an incidence in market policies. Consultancy work should be adapted more than to reference them to the changing conditions of the political context in the country. We started with an agenda, and if we were to analyze it now, 
we'll see it's completely different, not distorted, but changed, because we adjusted to the specific needs of the organization, of women, and the political situation of the country. Clearly, the progress made participating in the affairs program and understanding sovereignty as something more than a market, as a lifestyle, was important. As conclusions of this process, we can say that it's been for us in CMT in Costa Rica was a rich and generous process that allowed the strengthening of national union positions. The re results achieved in the case of women has given us keys to implement processes as I described, for example, with the fairs. We must acknowledge that we are still not in working together with academia, maybe more for intrinsic reasons than for because of lack of interest. The esteem process in theory should have allowed academia to have a greater participation, to have a higher level of participation. However, our level of process participation at the level of the farmers and particularly of women in the adoption of policies has not been very well linked and we need to put some common lines through all this. And to conclude, clearly we think there is a need to continue with a third phase to strengthen the space for research and incidents gained from all the experiences we've had. ESPIN has other projects in order to continue with the process. It's not easy, as you know, but we're making best efforts. Clearly, the challenges are strengthening the effective partnerships between organizations of farmers and researchers. Of course, we want to have a tropicalized research, as we call it, not what people want to research, but what we need to know. The continuity of the process and closing the gap between academia and the real rural life, which sometimes is not that clear. I thank you indeed for listening to my presentation, and I bring you greetings of all TFT women. Yeah, thank you very much, Shaleen. Uh, yeah, definitely there is actually much more you'd have uh, uh, presented, but uh, as, as, as usual, we are running out of time. But, but you actually brought uh, on board quite a number of I interesting issues uh, in, in form of new partnerships in, in putting together the forum where women are actually key players. And as women, you have actually been able to influence the, the forum uh, to be able to, to, to address uh, issues uh, that, that concerns uh, producers uh, in production and the market, the fair trade and so forth. Uh, uh, you have also uh, indicated that uh, uh, there is need to, to maintain struggle. Things are not very easy. You have to struggle through processes to be able to see, to see change. And I think this one actually came out very, very, very clearly. But as you said, there is actually a great need for, for capacity building uh, so that uh, producers can actually be able to, to continue with the sort of work that you have actually been doing. Uh, I would like to move to our next presenter, I hope uh, Jose will actually save us time. Uh, Jose, welcome, so I'm hoping that uh, you'll be able to save us time and also uh, share with us your experiences. Welcome. Good afternoon. Mi nombre es Jose Barbecillo. I am Jose Eduardo Castillo. I've worked all of this year for a, the Federation of Agrarian Cooperation, Cooperatives in Uruguay, which sought 
to improve support to the innovation capacity of the cooperative system. First of all, a very brief introduction to tell you a little bit about what TAF is. It's a federation of cooperatives established in 1984. It brings together around 26 cooperatives representing 13,000 producers. The farmers in Uruguay represent 25% of the rural producers in the country. And although there are some cooperatives outside the Federation, CAF brings together the most important cooperatives, if we can call them that. In general, they operate through different agro-industrial chains, and they're all diversified. N there isn't a single cooperative dedicated to only one heading. We have grains, uh, cattle, uh, sheep. They form part of different organizations as well. They have delegations in some public non-state uh, institutes, including the Institute for Agricultural Research. They work in different areas, uh, including union representation and competitive strengthening of their work. And within their structure, they strive to organize the technical and managerial areas. The, the overall objective of the project was to contribute to strengthen the innovation capacities of the Uruguayan cooperative systems in order to improve unity, competitiveness, and access to new market opportunities. You must bear in mind that when we speak of these 13,000 members of CAF, the farmers who form part of the different cooperatives, we have an enormous majority of medium-sized and small producers. In the Uruguayan scale, a small producer is not the same as in Costa Rica or El Salvador or in India. But most, I, I would say even uh, 10,000 of the 13,000 are medium-sized producers and small producers. We concentrate on innovation processes carried out by cooperatives. And a small clarification is in order because we're not looking at farmers at the primary level, but rather from the perspective of the cooperative itself. And what we see in the process of analysis is that cooperatives, although often not very much aware of it, they do include innovative processes in both in products, new processes, internal organization, and marketing. I cannot go into details because I don't have enough time to do that. But there are series, a series of innovative processes in all of these areas which are carried out often individually by the cooperatives or some jointly uh, in associations of cooperatives. I would like to focus a little bit on the opportunities and challenges that arise from an overview of the realities uh, in which cooperatives exist. They have great trust on the part of farmers. Farmers trust them a lot, and it's considered a key competitive factor. But at the same time, they are aware that they have a lack of long-term vision and, and commitment. They usually focus on resolving immediate pro pro problems, and they have scarce resources to look in the long term. We have different successful experiences, but at the, time, at the same time, the networks are weak, and the innovation processes are scarcely systematized. 
their ad hoc processes often to resolve one specific problem. And sometimes there's no systematic resource allocation process or uh, assessment of impact process. The networks are weak because although there is aware, awareness of the context, they often do not take advantage of synergy that would arise from interinstitutional cooperation. A internal organizational changes have been consolidated within the cooperatives 20 or 30 years ago. The cooperatives used to be very small enterprises that basically sold inputs for production, and today they have been modernized and processed internal changes. At the same time, however, they confront difficulties and challenges in retaining trained and skilled human resources, as well as in other parts of the world, it's difficult to retain youth in the rural environment and commit youth to work in rural associations. And so the cooperatives also face this problem of changing their levels of management and finding the resources to do so. Another issue is finance. In the 90s and beginnings of this the century, the cooperatives went through a crisis uh, in terms of indebtedness, but the context conditions improved. They have been financially cleaned up, but this faces constraints. Uh, although there's been a cleanup from the financial standpoint, they require even greater financial capabilities. And as you can imagine, in the past 10 years, there have been important changes with the growth of agriculture and the multinationals that invest in the country and have grown in numbers have different financial capabilities and they can compete from a position of advantage. The business environment is favorable, but there is great caution in decision making in any event, a little bit because people are scared of making the same mistakes they made in the past. In summary, improving the competitiveness of cooperatives requires several lines of action. One would be to provide integrated services, taking the cooperative to the partner, not waiting for the partner to come to the cooperative, aligning objectives among all participants, all stakeholders. It's also important to see at the level of the employees of the cooperative who are not necessarily farmers, to create incentives to promote fidelity of partners, many of them working in the livestock area. They don't use the cooperative for marketing, for, for livestock, they prefer other routes. To systematize, document, and analyze processes of change so that it may scale up things. Often we find that things are done in a way that's not too systematic, so that makes it difficult to scale up matters and create more capital, human capital. We require more effective policy for human resources and development of skills and uh, exploring financial alternatives as strategic alliances with non-cooperative enterprises, for example. We have several examples of this, or new marketing instruments. To, uh, in Uruguay, there's relatively scarce development in grain marketing, in working in, on futures, and only a few institutions take advantage of these marketing tools. Most are outside this circuit. I'm 
I'll change the order of my last slides. If we look forward, it would seem that there are two levels of action or two challenges faced by cooperatives. One is more internal to the cooperatives. The other one is has to do with action towards the outside. Internally, there's a need to consolidate the organization channel in order that proposals may flow upstream and downstream so that it, they just not include only the directors of cooperatives channeling all proposals, but rather the, the possibility for proposals coming from the farmers themselves, the need to reinforce capabilities to define roles and assign specific human resources. We must point out here that in order to systematize and make better use of innovative processes, often there aren't enough uh, human resources either trained or skilled to receive and process ideas that may lead to an innovative process. For example, in obtaining resources outside, from outside the system of cooperatives to fund innovation processes. It becomes uh, uh, something that's done in an improvised manner. This leads to some consequences. Some of the requirements, for example, Require, uh, the requirements of the financial agencies, often the cooperatives or the smaller cooperatives find obstacles in or problems to comply with the requirements of the agencies, also internally, to assess the impact of innovation. There is no culture or infrastructure in terms of assessment of innovation and evaluation of impact that should be sound, CAF out towards the outside. We uh, propose to work with the state, with, with international agencies, developing the, in making it cooperative smart to have more resources to see, to be more aware of the pathway we're following, providing advice, training, and dissemination of information to the farmers, strengthening links between cooperatives and inter-cooperative projects. There aren't too many of cases of this, but it's possible for CAF, not as operator of projects, but as facilitator. And then to bring together cooperatives by business area. In other words, cooperatives close both in geographic terms and in terms of their activities that may come together and carry out joint projects. We have some cases of large cooperatives that have an important agricultural area associate with smaller cooperatives to facilitate the growth of the smaller ones uh, working on agriculture in an association with the uh, larger cooperatives. In closing, my message would be that agricultural cooperatives can be seen as a support to the process of innovation, a support that provides the platform to reach successful projects because it's an appropriate platform that can lead to through reinforcement of links with the state and the national research agencies, which is a relatively new agency of the government and is responsible for advising the government in, on policies and research and it has the resources to fund this, but the cooperatives have made very little use of this tool, partially because of what I mentioned already, difficulties in lacking trained human resources to take advantage of this. Cooperatives have a capability of generating impact on medium-sized and small farmers. They've been strongly consolidated through the years and farmers have great 
confidence in these organizations and that relationship of trust is something that we must take advantage of. We could channel resources for innovation through the cooperatives to be certain that the impact on farmers is imp an important one. Cooperatives can also be leaders in an innovative process based on in associations. It, we're thinking of the smaller scale farmer associates. There are some innovative experiences where one or two cooperatives undertake leadership uh, among associates and they engage in cooperative activities. The farmers maintain their identity, identity as farmers, but they carry out joint projects under the leadership of the cooperative itself. Cooperatives form an active part of the agricultural and livestock sector, which I think is a strength of Uruguay. Cooperatives participate directly in the research institute, in the agriculture and the livestock program, which is the main means for extension work. They are about to participate in the Beef Institute, in the National Beef Institute, and they have a good uh, channel of communi communication with the ministry and the different agencies. There's a sound relationship there that enhances their potential. And finally, they offer access to public policy. Recently, CAF uh, entered an agreement with the Directorate uh, for National Rural Development, and they hired an expert to work specifically on this in this area to interact with the associations in the rural areas and take advantage of the whole structure of cooperatives that exist. So my final message is that agricultural cooperatives in Uruguay have been consolidated with the passing of time. They've faced difficulties in the past. They have a great pressure, competitive pr pressure in the context in which they exist, but they also have very good human capital that they bring together, so they're potentially an entryway and a means of empowerment so the country may forge ahead in this area. Thank you very much. So thank you, Jose, for uh, addressing issues around uh, uh, producer cooperatives in uh, Uruguay, Uruguay so honestly. But the important message is that uh, they exist, uh, and the potential is actually there. There are challenges, and many of those challenges are actually known. And they bring together, as you said, a lot of people. You said they are people-based, and that can actually be exploited. And I think this is an area that uh, will require attention. Uh, definitely, as a federation, we have actually brought together different uh, uh, unions uh, as partners. And I think uh, it is important that uh, uh, on the way forward, we actually get this partnership uh, uh, working. So your appeal is actually very clear. You, you need support uh, to be able to really get, get, get moving. But uh, uh, the, the, the setup is there, and uh, there is actually goodwill uh, from the cooperators themselves. And I think for us that is actually uh, very important. Now, uh, yeah, I would like us to proceed. Thank you very much. I would like us to proceed. And uh, uh, I'll be seeking your understanding uh, because I intend to uh, at least uh, uh, continue with the next uh, group of respondents. If they save us time, then we can actually secure 10 minutes to actually uh, interact. But before I actually call them uh, uh, here on board, I would like to give my facilitator one minute uh, to make a contribution. She told me it's a contribution. Eh? Okay, well, maybe as the people, as the respondents come up to the platform, and we thank the speakers very much for your contributions. I've just got two 
uh, apologies that have to be made from the organizing, uh, organizing committee. And this is particularly important for everybody who's listening on the, you know, globally. This session has, we have lost one whole hour of this session for reasons that are outside of the control of uh, this particular group. So we really do apologize for all the people who've got tweets and blogs who would have liked to have made a contribution to, to the debate. And of course, all the people here in, in, the, in the plenary. This was outside of our control. And the second comment I would like to make, please, for those here in the room and for those outside, is that when the Secretariat put together the, the sequencing of the slide pack, they accidentally put the IFPRI logo across many of the presentations. And as we know from the speakers list, it was only the first presentation which was attributed to IFPRI. All the other presentations were attributed to those individual, individual speakers. So those are two apologies, I have to say, that come from the administration. Thank you. So very good uh, for that for that clarification. I think is actually important, and I hope uh, I have on board uh, 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 the next uh, set of uh, speakers, uh, respondents, and, and I would like uh, to 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 uh, at least uh, focus you better because you need to be really focused because of the time factor. Uh, we look upon your your, your contribution, uh, uh, and especially in reflecting on the discussions we have actually had so far. Uh, because there has actually been issues coming from the participants, from the, the previous speakers, and uh, there, there, there are issues you can actually assist us, uh, clarify better, and even add value to them. Uh, I would also like to uh, 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 at least uh, encourage you to actually bring out your views on how the agenda can, take, can be taken forward. As we said, it's actually a partnership by different, uh, by different uh, stakeholders, you know, TGIR, you know, farm organizations, the private sector, networks, and many of the organizations that you actually represent. And uh, I would also like you to really come out even more focused as to, as to how you can actually uh, make a contribution. Because looking at, 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 at where you are coming from, you come from very major constituencies. And, and, and I think a partnership from you actually add value to what we actually look for in this particular process, especially linking small scale farmers uh, to, to, to market. I think these are some of the uh, 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 issues I would like you to really capture as you take advantage of your three, four minutes uh, that will actually be available to you. Uh, I think without uh, uh, much ado, I would like to start with the first uh, uh, respondent, I think. Uh, I hope it's, it is uh, Ajay. Yeah, welcome. Ajay is actually from, uh, is the chairman of a farmer forum uh, in India. Uh, welcome. Three minutes. Uh, good evening. So just coming to the point, as a farmer's organization, we have always disagreed with the agenda set by FAO and the CGIR system and various governments, democratic or otherwise, because all these institutions are only talking about increasing production. And as a farmer's organization, we realize that the farmer basically wants profitability. And these are two divergent goals. It's possible to give profitability and achieve productivity increases, but it is not necessary that if you increase production, there will be profit on the farm. And that's why this topic is very necessary because it has not been discussed. Post-production is rarely discussed in, in research. It's usually when, when you deal with CGIR system or FAO or anything, it's usually production that is discussed. So it's very nice that the focus now is coming to increasing the profit, and this market opportunities will actually help increase, will transfer, will help increase profit from extra production. In, in, in many developing countries, when production goes up, let's say for tomatoes, the price falls by 500%. So that's, that's exactly what we need is we need this market linkages and we need research for that. So we need research because it's, it's very complicated. Do you, do you, it's, it's perishables versus non-perishables, it's about aggregation, it's about credit to small farmers, all these will add up to if market accessibility and opportunities are available. And a lot has been said about cooperatives today because it is the best partnership model available. Private sector is not the best model. I am not against private sector. I say private sector is required 
but it will complement the cooperative sector. It will complement farmer organizations. It cannot be the primary goal. And that's what all researchers must understand. So cooperatives form a very important role. And when the private sector comes in, so that they may not make a monopoly, government regulations become even more important. So before the private sector comes in, the government regulations must be in place so they do not capture the market and destroy the competition which they're actually supposed to build. And, I'm, uh, and I really think that research is required on how to build market linkages with small farmers. It's very, very difficult. It's easy to say that it's, it's happening. And it's very difficult for success stories in one country, in one region to be replicated at other places. They need to be tweaked to local conditions, local uh, factors, and that's what's required. Thank you so much. Yeah, very good, very, very focused. According to Ajay, I think, uh, 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 you know, cooperatives are, are private sector. And I think that, that, is, that is key. Yeah, we've had cooperative success stories of milk as it was being discussed by Amul, which has transformed India's milk culture. We have IFCO, which is the largest fertilizer cooperative, which has transferred farmers by giving them inputs at good prices. Very good. And what is actually needed from research are actually innovations to enable cooperatives actually link the small farmers uh, to market. So that instead of the small farm actually negotiating with the larger private sector, there is actually business to business connection through cooperatives uh, with the small-scale farmers and the larger private sector, instead of actually just exposing the small-scale farmers. So I think that is, that is key. Now, I, I would like now to, uh, to, to take, uh, uh, to go to the next uh, uh, respondents is, is, is a good friend of mine, is a farmer leader, Robert Carthy, uh, the, the president of the World Farm Organizations. Organization, we, we met last in Rome and uh, uh, we have actually worked very closely with him, uh, uh, consultation and so forth. Uh, a number of my member organizations are actually members of the organization. So welcome. Time is limiting, but uh, let's hear from you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Philip. And I'd like to thank you, Philip, and Felicity for putting this session together. And let me tell you why this session is particularly appealing to me so much so that it's been worth waiting until uh, 5 o'clock or even later to, uh, to get to uh, participate. All through this meeting, I have been wondering, when are we going to start talking about how farmers benefit directly from the work that GCARD and GFRAS and others do and CIGAR uh, on research? Research is very, very important. And we know that without research, uh, we'd have a much less production, and it helps make farmers uh, a profit as well, uh, as AJ mentioned. So how do we get it in the hands of smallholder farmers so that it means something to them? That is the issue, and finally in this session we're talking about that, and I think it's very important, and I think what I heard from all the panelists today was positive in different ways, and I'll respond in a general way to, uh, to some of the things that, uh, that I heard. Um, let me just start by saying um, uh, farmers, do, uh, farmers do need markets. Markets are the link to making uh, a sale of their product uh, so that even if they are mostly doing subsistence farming for their families, they can sell some and improve their lives. And if they can improve their lives, send their children to school, get some health care, if, if smallholders can do that, it'll lift the economy of the village. If it lifts the economy of the village and the region, it can lift in the developing countries the entire nation state. So it's very, very important what farmers do. Um, I have a lot of notes here that I'm going to edit as I look at them. Uh, I thought the comment about weather insurance was just very, very innovative, and I, and I congratulate uh, the people who put that idea together. I think that uh, is going to be uh, popular, and I love that innovation, and I want to uh, uh, find out more about it. Uh, then there was mention of the farmer's place in the value chain and finding the farmer's place in the value chain. That's something that we at the World Farmers Organization talk about a great deal, the farmer's place in the value chain. And I have to say that whether it is smallholder farmers or commercial farmers, there has been that feeling that 
in the modern day, the farmer's spot in the value chain, the farmer is being squeezed from both ends, from the end of uh, supply of the products that the farmer needs to, uh, to make a crop or raise the animals, and from the other end, the retail level. So the farmer in that space, from beginning production of a crop to landing it on a plate where someone eats it, uh, the farmer feels, and, and research will show, that the farmer's share of the food expenditures are shrinking in relation to the other actors in the food chain, so that is an issue. There was also talk about contract farming. Um, as a farm leader for uh, many years and a farmer, I've had experience in this. We do know that contract farming, that the big multinationals who are doing contract farming with farmers, many of them are moving into developing countries with their contracts. I would urge uh, our farm organizations in those countries to take some leadership, be very careful about advising farmers about signing those contracts because you need to have some protection for farmers or they in effect become almost serfs on, on the land or raising the livestock if they don't have rights. Our organization, the World Farmers Organization, is currently engaged in a process with, uh, with an international legal team called Unidroit in Rome to draw up some model contracts for farmers who are thinking of getting into uh, contract farming. Uh, Co-ops. This is an issue that's dear to my heart. I won't talk about it as much as I'd like in the interest of time, but as AJ said, co-ops are the best model. Let me tell you from much experience from my father's day, my grandfather's day, and my day forming co-ops, I would say quite honestly, we probably have over that period of time more failures than we have successes. The co-ops today that are successful are built upon the foundations of those who went before us, many of whom failed. But it persists, and co-ops are still being built today. And um, I have some practical things to say about how to make co-ops successful, how to be practical. You need a dream, but it needs to have practicality. You need good advice, you need a feasibility plan, and you need to have access to capital or at least a lender who can give you some good advice because if the dream gets in the way of practicality, the co-op can get into trouble. Um, these were all excellent presentations. I think the presentation uh, from the president of the uh, co-ops in Uruguay was very, it, it shows us something, it was very insightful. It shows that an established co-op system can do a lot for farmers and that once farmers have an asset in their co-ops, it gives them a voice to speak about policy. It gives them an opportunity to realize gains in the market, and it gives them an opportunity to open a spot in the market and to enhance uh, their power in the food chain. So I think that was very good. Overall, this is a very positive session. What farmers need to do is get into the markets, um, and it does take commitment, it takes perseverance, and it takes a dream, quite frankly, but it's a dream that has to be tempered by reality. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Robert. Uh, definitely, you have actually added value to the to, to GCAD 2012, and I'm sure uh, come uh, the next uh, GCAD, you actually even be able to uh, to to bring real issues. Uh, on the table coming from uh, from your organization. Uh, it has actually been a very short time, but you have actually been able to connect so fast. And I think for me that is actually uh, very encouraging. I would like at this stage to actually uh, invite uh, Dr. D. Like on the other side, he is actually Deputy Director General of ICRIS at uh, India. So welcome, and uh, with time constraints, we, we, we share your experience. Well, let me just thank um, Philip and Felicity as well for the opportunity to, to give a brief response. Uh, I, I think I kind of represent the other side of the coin uh, that Tone was, was mentioning in his talk about coming in from the research perspective. Uh, but I think that my take home message is that sessions like this and having been in the CGIR for, for too many years without sessions like this, this is a good opportunity to start this dialogue and to realize that that Farming is a business, that farmers need to produce products that fit into a marketplace, 
and therefore the research agenda of the CGIR has to be reflected by that. Some general comments from, from ICRASAT's perspective uh, and, and how we're looking at it, we've just came out with a new strategic plan a couple of years ago, and we subtitled that Inclusive Market-Oriented Development. And we did that particularly because we realized that at least in, in the environments that we're working in, in rain-fed agriculture throughout Africa and, and Asia, smallholder farming has to be focused on how they're going to produce enough not only to feed themselves, but as well to enter into market opportunities. And we put the word inclusive up front because we wanted to make sure that the farmer has to be involved in that process. And so it's already beginning to shape our research agenda as we look towards what should be our priority. We've also set up some programs, uh, one of which is, is the Agribusiness and Innovation Platform, which really now allows us to begin looking at how do we actually incubate business opportunities for linking smallholder farmers to, to markets, how do we actually create innovation and partnerships uh, in those opportunities, and how do we actually build then a knowledge for novel products that could come out of a smallholder farming opportunity for particularly the kinds of crops that we're looking at. These have already been, been expanded upon, particularly in India, through the Indian Council for Agricultural Research, through their, their programs to allow us to backstop their development and scaling out of those ideas uh, throughout India. And we're also working with FARA through the Unibrain program uh, in Mali to look at how do we facilitate some of the development of those agribusiness entrepreneurships uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. When I think about what would I hear from the discussions here, how would it affect the research that we're doing, not only in, in ICRASAT, but as well within the CGIR research programs, I think three things come out, and we've heard some of them already. We know that, that much of the research in, in crop production has been about quantity. And we, we know that now there's a lot more emphasis on nutrition, and how are we gonna produce nutritious grains and, and products. But I think we now understand that it's also all about market quality and market opportunities. And so it's multiple uses of crops, whether it be for food, feed, fodder, or even fuel potentially. And looking at the, the trade-offs of that and looking at what is the right quality that comes in to create a market opportunity when a farmer can produce excess uh, product. I think as well, thinking about the maturities of the crops and how do we actually tailor those crop maturities to meet market opportunities and to produce a continuous supply, which is often a requirement to, to be able to address many of the markets uh, that smallholder farmers would like to. And finally, I think we have a lot to do to look at what happens post-harvest. How do we eliminate post-harvest losses? How do we maintain quality? And what kinds of research should we be doing to look at processing that markets would like to have? And so I think it's beginning to now already shape the research agendas in many of the CGIER centers definitely is a major component of almost all of the CGIR research programs. And I think it's the sessions like this that need to continue so that we continue to maintain the dialogue and begin understanding how should the markets shape not only what smallholder farmers should be doing, but what should the researchers be doing if they're trying to produce those commodities, those crops the smallholder farmers are growing. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you, David, for bringing in uh, your experiences from India, and I'm glad you're actually sharing with, uh, with Africa through FARA, uh, because uh, India has uh, experiences and lessons that can actually uh, help we farmers in Africa through our institutions, like uh, research institutions and extension, uh, improve productivity and also be able to, 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 to do business. And thank you for actually bringing on, on board the issue, on, the issue of uh, uh, post-harvest losses. Uh, figures are amazing, huge, and I think we need to actually also ensure that as we link producers to markets, uh, we, we, we manage uh, uh, post-harvest uh, uh, losses. Uh, I, I would like to now uh, invite the only lady, I hope she is at home with us, here, Danielle. Uh, Danielle is actually a policy advisor of the CJL consortium, and uh, I would like you to at least uh, interrogate uh, the, the presentations and uh, uh, package them in a manner that we are actually able to move forward. Time is our problem, but uh, I'm sure you'll be able to do that. Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much. Really, I am very, very happy to be here uh, to, to participate in this very interesting session and this huge challenge that everybody had in terms of agricultural research for development to turn on innovation into market opportunity. Proud to talk on behalf of the CGR and in my home country, so imagine double, double proud to be part of the CGR and here in, in, in Uruguay. I would like to start just to mention, last month I was traveling and I thought one interesting thought of the statement from Danny Rodrick, who is a, a professor of the University of Harvard, who works in the field of economical policy. And he quoted, he quoted that agricultural productivity improvement are among the hardest to transmit from one nation to another nation. And this is a peer the role of, of, of what is to really, uh, to have impact on poverty and hunger through our agricultural research for development only can be possible with specific adaptations to different local market conditions. And when we say local conditions, sometimes we are talking about population that less than 1,000 person or less than 100 person. So imagine the challenge to do that. For example, from the perspective of the CGR, when we have the, uh, originally we have a, glo a global mandate. So the only way to do that is through partnership. There is not only way to, to do that to really have impact on the, on the ground. So este, I would like just to complement and maybe to address the concern of our facilitator just to um, resume how the CCR consortium work on that. I will say that the consortium, now the new consortium, the new CCR consortium is, wor is working in three levels. The first uh, level that I will say that all the CRP, our current portfolio research program, all by mandate, they have to direct links to market conditions. Today we have este, some illustration and in the other session, how the CGR, not only in the, in the agenda of research in itself, also how to try to really go with the research to the hand of the farmers and also to the consumers as, as well. The second level, we have a specific CGR research program that, is, that you had the opportunity today to hear about that, the CRP on policy market institution that is designed to interact and to support the other CRPs. And this is, we hope, that really the expertise of the people that are behind of that, especially the, the, the elite center that are behind that work with the other centers, institutions, for example, just really to put all their technologies, all their tools and technology to help the other CRP to really work on this area that is policies, institution, and value chain. And finally, you said that the third level that the consortium, the CCR consortium is working is at the system level, yeah? Through the consortium office, we are identifying some cross-cutting areas or some projects that cover all the CRP to try to lead this process. And I would like to uh, exemplify with one, the CADAP CCR alignment. This is a very interesting project that we have started to working on that which objective, objective imagine that is to align the agenda of the CGR with the agenda of more than 40 countries in, in, in Africa. Two months ago, I had the opportunity to participate in one workshop and imagine there were staff of the CGR working there representing the 15 CRPs with seven country, country teams, with country team of seven countries on, on Africa, trying in four days Yes, try to align and mapping the priorities of, of that. The first day say, it could be possible to do that? Yes, it was possible. The fourth day, it was amazing to see the seven country, the names of the seven country of Eastern Africa, identify to which CRP they would like to work and which, in which component of the CRP they say that could be benefit for us. So with this experience, yes, we can do that. So this week, we are exploring the same exercise to do here in Latin American and Caribbean country. So my message is, yes, a huge challenge, but it's possible to do. Thank you very much.
very good. That was, that was actually quite clear and, and, and very focused. Uh, uh, I, I would like uh, to, to apologize because we cannot actually be able to have time for, 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 for further interaction, but I need to actually make a quick uh, wrap up. I think today's presentations and also your interaction as, as participants has illustrated uh, that uh, through national and international partnership, uh, some progress can, uh, can be made. Uh, we have also been, uh, uh, we have also learned that uh, th there are new initiatives, especially through CGIR uh, Global Research uh, Program that, uh, that, that Karen actually uh, uh, presented. Uh, we also know that uh, uh, the, the, an ongoing uh, national initiative from uh, Chile is actually linking uh, 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 private sector to, 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 to uh, a process that supports most of farmers in linking uh, uh, with the market. Uh, uh, a number of issues have actually emerged that out of the session. Uh, uh, there, there, there is actually need uh, for uh, a clear uh, uh, research-based partnership that will actually contribute uh, uh, to policy, to institutional change, to support small scale and also family, family farming. This has actually come out very clearly. Uh, we have also seen uh, different uh, funding and partnership uh, models that were actually presented by, by our speakers uh, here. And, and I think uh, uh, th th there is actually need for follow up and making sure that uh, th they work for the small scale farmers in linking them to market. Uh, we also know that uh, there is no single model that, uh, for partnership that, uh, that, uh, that, is, that, uh, that is key, but there has actually been propositions, there has actually been uh, proposals and examples of actually what works out there cooperatives, you know, the, the innovation uh, platforms, you know, uh, models of alliance of different uh, players, public, private, and uh, also farm organizations, uh, as, as, as was presented here by, uh, by, by, by Chile. There is also need to continue search for models and mechanisms that will actually work for, for, for small scale uh, producers in linking them to market. And I think uh, uh, the, cooperative, uh, the cooperative model was actually key uh, because we actually raised its profile. We said uh, co cooperative business model is actually a private sector model and this needs to be linked with, uh, with accessing uh, small farmers to, uh, to, to market. There were issues around uh, researchers actually understanding, uh, you know, market driven, driven process, especially uh, market uh, chain actors. And uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not referring to general understanding. But what producers are actually doing now is that uh, they are trying to come up with, uh, with value chains that, uh, that, that they can drive. And that's why most of the producers, even the small scale farmers now, have an enterprise that is a commodity uh, that can actually be connected to value chain. And uh, along it, they actually understand different uh, processes, they understand gaps, and they actually go out and look for missing actors, gaps, and also source capacity. That is a chain driven by the producer themselves. The difference here is that uh, that sort of approach to us enables us to have slightly more power in the marketplace because we are managing those processes. And I think researchers need to do this because we are already there. My organization, the, third, the number two thrust in our strategy is actually value chains. And we are doing the analysis, we are actually uh, assisting farmers actually identify gaps, we are actually using uh, the information along the chains to provide capacity, capacity that is actually demand driven. And I think this is the only way that researchers can actually provide us with innovative ways of linking us to market. Because it will actually be there as a gap uh, along the chain. That will be demand driven. And I think for us that is actually very important. Uh, I would also like to get to the program that uh, Karen uh, uh, introduced, uh, the, uh, the current program of, of, the, of the CGIR uh, that she's, act she's actually managing. Uh, it's, it's actually a very interesting program, but, but, but I think we still need to, to get deeper into it. I, I, I think it is important that uh, if it is actually meant to link small farmers to, uh, to, 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 to market and also identify different uh, missing uh, you know, uh, uh, gaps in information, in, in capacities and so forth. There is actually a need to actually really connect it with, uh, with the producers. 
and uh, there is also need for better understanding. Maybe a bit of uh, awareness creation is actually good, and even negotiating priorities so that uh, uh, producers can actually bring on board what, what is it that they actually would like to see th this, program, uh, this program address. And beyond that, because CGI is actually a global system, and any, gr any program that is act actually global has to find an entry point so that it can actually be able to find a home at the village level. And I think this needs to be addressed uh, because it's different, you know, it's global and there's, there's need to actually find a window that to actually provide, uh, you know, provide a, a way down. And I think we actually have partnerships that can do that in the private sector, in the continents of Asia, Africa, and others that can actually provide an entry point and be able to actually link that process to, to, the, the, to the national level. And I think for us, it is actually very, very, very important. Uh, I would like finally to actually thank all of you for your participation. It has actually been rich. Uh, uh, we have captured a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, good experiences uh, around uh, strengthening our knowledge uh, platforms. And I'm glad most of the research institutions are working around knowledge so that we can actually be able to, 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 to provide lessons and experiences that will enable small scale farmers uh, uh, be empowered and uh, be able to link uh, with the market. There are issues around uh, uh, building strategic alliances and they actually came very well from the, from the presenters. There, are, there is also need for, for ev evidence-based advocacy that, uh, that needs research to be able to actually help us package a lot of messages that, that make sense to policymakers, and I think this is actually very, very important. There are cross-cutting issues that also needs uh, 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 partnership and working together. And overall, there is actually capacity needs, you, capacity at all levels, because for researchers to be able to service uh, stakeholders and small farmers, they need capacity. And I think uh, it is important that uh, we help mobilize and call upon everybody to support uh, research systems for them to be able to actually provide services to, to, to the producers. I think uh, with this, uh, we conclude, and I would like again to thank you very much for being uh, uh, with us, uh, uh, and so faithful and so interactive, and also the, 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 the presenters who actually did a very good job, respondents who also actually interrogated the entire process. I'm sure we had uh, time constraints. Time is never enough, but I think uh, within the available situation, we actually did uh, the best we could. And maybe we can actually clap uh, for ourselves. Huh? <laughs> so thank you very much. You get ready for the next session, which is actually going to take place uh, in this room. And thank you to my facilitator. She was actually very great.
Hola, uno, dos, tres. Ok. Estos dos quedan en la mesa. El 8 y el 10. Two, one, two, eight. Okay. 